بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا Welcome to the third and final installment of Quranic Parenting um, Alhamdulillah, thank you for all of uh, those who've been tuning in. The videos are available on the MCC website if you wanted to go back and watch the first two sessions. Uh, but this will be the final session, so I'm going to now zip through some slides because um, I need to get to section three today. Um, and last week I did a summary, but it took a little bit of time, so I'm just going to ask all of you to go back and watch those to, to get uh, session two. But session three is on balanced parenting. So with that said, let's go ahead and begin. Um, here's a beautiful quote from Imam al-Ghazali. To get what you love, you must first be patient with what you hate. So there are a lot of things that we, we, we need these reminders as we um, continue to parent or if we embark on the journey of parenting, that it is a constant balancing act between a lot of emotions. Um, and and it's, if you have this perspective, then inshallah, you will manage, you'll manage. It won't be easy, but you'll manage. So balanced parenting is really, again, knowing how to navigate the demands of the dunya which we are all sometimes drowning in, um, with the goals and objectives of the akhira for yourself as well as your children. Uh, because although we live here, this is not where we reside or wish to reside, right? We're here temporarily. So just like when you vacation, you go and you rent a space, it's only temporary, right? Your final or actual home is somewhere else. So that's how the believer looks at dunya, that this is just we're passing through, but we still have to live. So therefore, you have to be able to uh, meet those demands as well as keeping your eye on the final destination, which is the life after this world. And that is for you as well as your children. So always keeping both of these in balance, right? What do I need to do to survive in this world? But what do I need to do to have salvation in the next world, right? Survive and salvation. So you want to think of those two. Um, and so I, I mentioned this last time. I like acronyms because they work. They're easy to remember. I make them up. They're, it's nothing special. But here's an acronym that I hope is helpful for you. Uh, balanced parenting is parenting with PMC. I know it's not as catchy, but um, let's work with this. So the first one is prioritizing, right? This is knowing your responsibilities first and then the rights. Sometimes we enter either the domain of marriage or parenting always with all of our rights in check. Like we know what we're going to get, what we expect, what's due to us. But then when you follow up with, do you know what is expected of you? We don't really always know those things, right? So you have to know the rights, uh, the responsibilities of the, of, of, uh, you know, the role that you're going to take on first. And then after you've really you know, make sure you have that uh, down, then you move on to your rights, right? So you should know what are the rights of children over the parent, not the opposite, right? What, what is the child's right over me? What will I be called uh, into account for? What is Allah expecting of me? Because as we mentioned, parenting is an amana. It's a trust from Allah. So right there, the, the role or the responsibility is on us to fulfill the rights of children, right? But if we don't even know those, Clearly, that's a problem. So we have to know what the rights of children are over us. Next, are, then we, f we can learn what are the rights of the parent over the child, right? Now that I know my responsibility as a parent, what am I owed as a parent, and what should I be guiding my children to so that I am raising responsible children who understand that Life is always about this balance, right, of roles, responsibilities, rights, and so that they understand also what's expected of them. And over time, as they grow, that they um, really, um, again, have a clear understanding. And then the next thing is really important, because this is probably, in my estimation, one of the biggest contributing factors to why households are falling apart, is because we have not yet defined are we going to model our marriages and families according to our cultures or Islam? Because if it's your culture, 
you're going to likely have a lot of problems, especially when you look at blended families and you have a husband and a wife who come from two different cultures. Now, who, who gets to call the shots, right? Because if my culture, if I think my culture is the best and my husband thinks his culture is the best, then what, we're going to be squabbling over every little thing? You know, my this is, uh, you know, the custom in my uh, family. Um, it, your, yours isn't as good. And it's just this constant competition that's really terrible to start off of a marriage like that, let alone a family, but so many people do that. Um, and even within the same cultures, you'll have this. So it's not even an, a you know, mixed family. You'll have, well, my uh, you know, tribe of this culture does it this way, or my family did it this way. It's all ignorance, and it's why we have so many problems. So we have to go back to making that definitive decision, which is our family is going to be run according to Islam. The model that's set before us by the Prophet ﷺ and what he uh, taught us and all of uh, the teachings of our faith that have come after, that is what we are going to run our family according to, not culture, because culture changes, it, 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 you know, it's, it's fluid. Islam is fixed and it's perfect. Um, then you want to go into the next uh, uh, part here, which is modeling. Again, if you want a balanced household, you have to understand that children learn, especially when they're younger, they learn mostly from modeling. They're watching you, they're learning, and they're imitating. And if you're not going to put forth virtuous acts and be a good person in, in all of the, that meaning, then to expect that your child has the uh, best uh, adab and manners and, and is, is just a model child is... is is quite frankly uh, insane because where would they learn that if you're not doing that yourself so you have to be working on your own self and really correcting your own character so that your children can learn from you but if you're oblivious to yourself and you're just you know dictating to your children thinking that they're gonna learn under your command uh, it doesn't work that way so they need proper guidance they need to um, you know, make sure that, again, uh, that you, ha you have that understanding, that they learn from by imitating, listening, and observing. So model good behavior, excellent behavior. And then the last part of this is customizing, right? So this idea of a one-size-fits-all model of, of parenting is also, uh, it doesn't work. There are, there are philosophies of parenting, but each of us have to really think about what works for our family. And so if you have multiple children in your, uh, in your family, you have to take the time as a parent to know them, to know their temperament, their personalities, what's different about one. In one house, you will find multiple different personality types. You'll find the aggressive, kind of intense personality type, you know, strong-willed. You'll have the more sensitive. You'll have the extroverted that is very social and, you know, out and about and makes friends easily. And then you'll have others that are more introverted. If you don't realize this about your children and you kind of just give all your kids the same rules and, and, and expect them all to fall in line like little you know uh, soldiers in an army, it just doesn't work that way. You have to be paying attention to the nuances in your children's personalities and realize that even in the same household, even in the same womb, right, twins, triplets, quadruplets, all of them, their womb mates, right, as they call them, you will find children who share the same womb, completely different temperaments. That's Allah. That's just a proof of Allah right there. They have the same DNA, but completely different personalities and temperaments. So you have to take the time to know them. And also you have to know about what each child, what the dangers are for each child. Like if you have a child that's easily influenced, it's, they're, they're very you know people-pleasing, you have to know that they're going to have a very different set of dangers than the one that is super strong willed and you know has a very like kind of take charge attitude they have a different set of circumstances they're working with right are they going to have you know each of them will have challenges because of those you know what they're presenting so the dangers as uh, when they're young look like that but as they grow older right think of a highly influential child that go enters adolescence what happens to that child when, when you know, a, 
they make a friend with someone in school that's telling them, hey, let's go do this and let's go do that. If you're not aware of your child's temperament to give them the, the, the strength to be able to resist giving in to people pleasing and just kind of going along with the, the crowd, then they will fall. And that's what, what's happening everywhere. You're finding a, just a crisis with our youth because all of these children who have not been fortified with what they need specifically are being then set out into, um, you know, amongst the wolves. And we expect them to be fine. It doesn't work that way. We, we're, our responsibility is to protect them. Part of protection isn't just keeping them safe uh, from, you know, shelter and, 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 and all of that. It's also seeing the, the present dangers and giving them the tools necessary. This is what tarbiyah is, the tools necessary for them to navigate the world. But it requires present parenting. It requires that you're paying attention and you actually care to know the differences in your child's personality. And that's where temperament theory is very useful. I think I may have mentioned it before, but temperaments we have in our faith, this is called mizaj. It is to study the, t the different temperaments. So I mentioned extroverted, introverted. You also will understand the difference between a reactive child and a non-reactive. So for example, if you have a child that gets very easily agitated and blows up emotionally, they just, they can't contain their emotions. I mean, that's typical of young children, but even if you have adolescents or, or young teenagers who are very instantly, you know, just, it's like a switch comes on, uh, that child needs to learn how to regulate that emotion, right? Because they can, it can harm them and they can harm other people. That's why you see a lot of harm happening in the world because of people who've never learned to regulate that emotional response to whatever the circumstance is, right? But then you have the opposite of a child who is non-reactive. And so there, there are a lot of, uh, you know, kids, for example, who get bullied easily. It's not that they are weak. We, we make that mistake and assume that some children have a slower emotional process to heightened situations. So when a classmate comes and grabs their, you know, thing, you know, whether it's a young child or, or in an, in, 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 with an older kid, if something happens to them that kind of comes left field, they're not prepared for it, they have that freeze, you know, they, they kind of freeze in the moment. Um, now, if you don't teach your child that that's natural, right, then what happens is someone else tells them how to label themselves or think of themselves. You're weak. So then they carry that label forever, that, oh, I'm this weak person because I can't respond or react in the moment. That is horrible to do that to a young child. Whereas if you teach them before, which is what we're supposed to do, that listen, Allah made all of us very different. Some people are reactive, some people are not. And the beautiful examples that we can draw from, which is where present parenting is, is really shown, is look at the Khulafa al-Rashidun. They are, each of them, they represent one of the four temperaments. And they were all very powerful leaders, but they were not the same. You have Abu Bakr, who was very quiet, subdued, but incredibly strong. He was the right hand of the Prophet ﷺ, always there by his side, dutiful, stable. But he was not a person of many words, right? And then you have Omar, radiallahu anhu. He was in intimidating. People were terrified of him, right? And that's why when he embraced Islam, he brought so much strength to the Ummah because he was just this mountain of a man. And he maintained that throughout his life. And then you have uh, Uthman, who was gentle, so gentle that the angels were shy of him. He was, he was known to have incredible modesty. Even the angels were shy of Uthman. And then you have Sayyidina Ali, who is cheerful and so warm and welcoming. All of them, again, according to our scholars, representing one of the four temperaments. You have in, uh, in uh, Sayyidina Abu Bakr, you have the melancholic, which is, again, not very verbose, not very talkative, but stoic, strong, non-reactive, stable force. Choleric is the next temperament. That's in uh, Omar. Forceful. Very uh, outspoken, right? Formidable. Then you have Uthman, radiallahu anh, said Uthman, who is the phlegmatic temperament, gentle, very um, loving, modest, kind of just calming present. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you have said Ali, who was the sanguine, cheerful, sociable, always, you know, just warm and welcoming. 
these are beautiful models that we can teach our children so that they see that all of their temperaments are beautiful and not one is not better than the other. So I remember once I did a talk many years ago uh, at an event and this mother came to me afterwards. I was talking about temperaments and she came to me afterwards and she was crying. She was crying because she said, I wish I knew this when my children were younger. She said, as you're explaining this, I realized that I punished my quiet son always, his whole life, because I compared him to his older brother, who was the more outgoing, athletic, super talkative, social one. She said, I didn't realize, I just thought he was deficient, right? Because that's what the society tells you. They, they, we, we, we create these you know, black and white archetypes where it's like, if you're not this way, there's something wrong with you. And our children are susceptible to those messages because in their world, what, what children are exposed to by celebrities and by all the other stuff that's in, on the online pr world is saying the same thing. That if you're famous, you're cool, right? You're relevant. If you have a lot of followers or in school, if you are what? Popular, right? If you're popular, that means you have a lot of friends, which means you're super um, funny, you're outgoing, you're charming, right? And so a, a child is told to look at themselves constantly in contrast to that. And if they don't fit that, they feel that they are what? I'm a loser. This is the self-talk of our children. Our youth are literally bombarded with this message in their inner voice. I have no friends. I'm a loser. I'm quiet. I don't speak up in class. I'm a loser. I'm this. I don't. I don't. Uh, you know, sign up for this sport or do this. I'm a loser. This is the negative self-talk because nobody is telling them that no, you're not a loser. You're actually one of the beautiful temperaments that Allah gave us, and this is actually, you know. And then you can go on and expand and say that the Prophet said I'm had all four of these temperaments in perfect balance, and so you're representing one of his temperaments, right? And this is how we empower our children to not fall into the narratives that they're being taught in, the, in this general society. A parent who's not aware of these things will not know to do that. They won't even talk to their children about these things. And sometimes we are the ones actually who are giving them those messages, right? What's wrong with you? When I was young, I never did that. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you? If that's what your children are hearing, why would you expect them to have any sense of confidence in themselves? Because you're making a comparison to either yourself or other children, your cousins, how many kids, and I hear from youth, by the way, so I'm not speaking in just general terms. I'm telling you of some of the pain that youth have come to me with about what their parents tell them. You know, they're comparing them to cousins or other friends always and making them feel that they're deficient. And it's because we have failed to recognize that our children are all beautiful. Every single child is beautiful. They are light. They are in fitra. They are sinless, right? And that's why we love to see children. You know, uh, Sheikh Hamza mentioned this recently, but he said, you know, when you look at the face of children, right, it just, it lights you up. You don't feel that with adults, you know? <laughs> we don't get like, oh, with, you know, I mean, some adults, mashallah, when they're, when they're people of God, but generally speaking, because he was saying we've amassed so much sin, right, that it's reflecting in our face, whereas children are pure and sinless. They even smell pure, you know. He was saying this too, like an adult, you don't bathe for a few days, it's not a, it's not a pleasant sight or, or smell. But children, well, you, you don't really see anything, right, subhanAllah, because they're sinless. So they are light, and if you don't appreciate that about them and you just kind of, you know, they're nuisances, shooing them away, or... You know, we just we, we need to bring back, restore that that sense of respect towards children, inshallah. But this is balanced parenting, so that prioritization, modeling, and customizing, and it's also now a reminder about that. We've mentioned this, but another reminder: of parenting is a trust from God, right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala actually tells us now specifically: fear Allah and treat your children small or grown fairly with equal justice. We all need this reminder because we're very. Um, we coddle young children and we're tending, we're tending to them. We, we rush to them as soon as they have something going on because we're so afraid they're fragile to us, right? But as our kids get a little older, we uh, start to, you know, wane in that, in that attentiveness towards them. And we almost kind of just figure it out, right? Do it on your own. Um, and that's not to say there's, you know, anything wrong with trying to create that sense of independence and autonomy in children, but it's more about the heart. 
And if you are no longer, um, you know, treating your grown-up children with that same sense of fairness and, and mercy and compassion and justice that you were when they were younger, this is the message that you need to be reminded of because their age doesn't matter. You cannot be harsher just because your child is now bigger and, and seems like they're an adult, which, yes, when, when they're technically speaking, when they've reached puberty, they are considered adults in Islam, but that doesn't mean that you um, begin to speak to them in a, in a way that you've diminished that, that sense of justice and fairness, right? Because you see sometimes parents losing a lot more patience with older children than they, than they ever would with younger children. And it's because, you know, you should know better. That's the attitude. And a lot of it does come back to that comparison. I could never speak to my parents this way. I would never leave my bedroom this way. I would never do this. And, and the harshness comes through, but your treatment of the child should still be fair and just be on the side of truth. Don't let your ego always uh, run the show, basically, whether they're young or small. Um, and then we mentioned that children's rights are mandated by God, so we have to know what they are. And there are hadith that, that uh, describe, uh, in essence, what the rights of children are, but among them are that they have a beautiful name, that you name your children with beautiful names, um, and not names that are, uh, you know, in any way disparaging. Sometimes for, you know, people, people will come up, and I'm sure you've seen it now, there's a lot of um, attention-seeking behavior even through children, right? So it's like, I want a weird name that has some abstract meaning. I've seen people with like even symbols and letters and like, there's no real meaning to that name, but it's, it makes the parent feel good. You know, like I got a, I got a cool, eclectic, strange name. I'm the mother or father of so-and-so. But if that name has no meaning or it has a, a bad meaning, um, this would be, you know, wrong on the parent because the child should be, uh, you know, deserving of, of something of honor, right? So name your children with excellent names. Another right is that we educate them and give them sound education. Now, the word education is complicated because immediately we think of schooling, right? But we're not talking about schooling here necessarily. We're talking about tarbiyah. That your children need to know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to know the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They need to know the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They need to know their aqidah. They need to have a grounding in the deen. And that takes precedence over all the other stuff that we're worried about. And I know because I was there too with my young children. The first thing you think about is, oh my God, can they read? I need to get them to read. So we are, we're all thinking of ABCs in the womb. Like the first book is like, okay, ABCs. You're like, the infant is like just born yesterday. We don't need to read to that child yet. But there is this fear, right, that, that we're not going to, we're going to mentally, you know, handicap them if we don't do these things early. But then the spiritual handicap nobody thinks about. What about their spiritual well-being? What if they don't know anything um, or they don't have the right understanding and then you put them into environments where they're going to get the wrong understanding? How are they going to navigate that? So if you're going to not give your children that foundational knowledge, but then put them in an environment where they are taught by other people who literally do not believe in God and who may, in fact, you know, in one way or another, um, get that message across to your children, then how can they protect the, the, how can they be protected? So it's our task to lay the very, very strong foundation. And when it comes to the, uh, the six articles of faith, for example, you know, we know, right? God, his messengers, his books, his prophets, the angels, the day of judgment, heaven and hell, qadr, right? These are the six articles. I would caution with young children introducing the heavy topics. We don't need to talk about fire and brimstone and hellfire. We don't need to talk about shaitan with young children. They don't need to know that Iblis exists. Don't scare them and frighten them like, oh, it's dark at night. You know, don't do this. Or, you know, people will sometimes, it's very cultural to do that, but it's, it's traumatizing to young children when you introduce those ideas because they're in the world of imagination and play and they're in fitra and inshallah they're with Allah always in this, this beautiful state. And then you bring them out of that, as we say, the Garden of Eden and you cast them into hell with these images, terrifying images. No, don't do it. If you need to control your, par your children, threatening them with that kind of message is not the way to go. You have to do better. And the better thing to do is to actually teach them about Allah and, and love of Allah and Jannah and angels of light and the stories, the incredible stories from the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, which we should know. Because one of the things that I find devastating in the modern world is that our children would rather sit in front of a screen, which is just, you know, puts them in a complete uh, spell and, and, 
you know, extended exposure, as we know, absolutely affects their brain. But they would rather do that because they've entered uh, this fantastic world of lights and images, all based on farce. It's all lies, right? It's all imagine. It's just it's fantasy. It's not real. But then we haven't done our job to convey to them the truth of a story like the revelation, right? Like Isra wal Miraj, when when the Prophet ﷺ was first, you know, seeing Angel Jibreel. If we don't have the words, because we haven't learned those stories well enough to convey these powerful, real, truthful stories to our children, but then we're quick to turn on Disney Plus and, and, and Netflix and let them enter that world of where shaitan, I mean, literally, they, if you haven't done the research, look, go and look at the, the many people who've, who've shown the hidden symbolism in a lot of the messages in Disney films. There are subliminal messages. This is not, um, you know, conspiracy theory. It's real. They do not really care. They like to, you know, put put certain things out there because that's the way they normalize things, right? So anyway, that's a different conversation. But think about this as a parent that you need to know these stories well so that they can come to a masjid, inshallah, or come, you know, to a space where they will feel so invigorated by hearing a story about, you know, when, when Angel Jibril came to and he saw the process and he said squeeze like all of that imagery that you're bringing because you've done the work to say I'm going to show you what a real incredible story looks like you know if you're and, and not uh, keep uh, turning you away to video games and films I'm going to bring that to you that awe of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'm going to show you that and I'm going to sustain that with continued uh, exposure to the seerah and the Quran because there are miracles upon miracles upon miracles that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has left for us that are treasure it's a treasure trove of stories but we don't know it so then we don't know how to convey it and we cannot expect the masjid or a teacher to always do it it's on us as parents to learn if you can read you have to know how to do these things so an education is really um got to be a, it's a, th that knowledge of god that's the ultimate and the highest form of knowledge so this is just a reminder for all of us, you know, um, to lead. We mentioned about modeling bef before, but we have to lead by example, and we have to know the difference between commanding the respect and demanding. When we begin to raise our voice to our children, which we all are guilty of at times, and sometimes it's because they're far. That's not what I'm talking about. Because if you're just trying to reach them, that's fine. But if it's they're right in front of you and you're angry because maybe you want something done or something happened, that shouldn't have happened. Um, a perfect example, you know, uh, your child goes to um, to to get some milk, and then the entire jug collapses on the floor. Right? You have to. If that's ever happened to you before, or a glass breaks, or something just you know disturbs you because it was it was an unexpected event, pay attention to your reaction in that moment. Right? Some parents. I've seen it actually. It's quite tragic and very upsetting to see a young child be reprimanded harshly because their small hands can't hold like sorry. Oh may Allah forgive us because we, we let the world overwhelm us, but then we don't realize these precious hearts don't deserve a scolding because their hands couldn't hold something properly. So we have to move away from this idea that, that if I raise my voice, I get what I want. That is a failure of parenting. You don't need to raise your voice. You just need to speak with respect, and you can be firm. You can say, please don't do that, but to yell, to threaten, or to scold harshly and humiliate a child just because they were children is a failure on us. And may Allah forgive us for breaking pure hearts of, of, of children. May Allah never let us do that to children. So this point about, you know, tailoring our parenting is really important, as I mentioned. But here we have some sage advice from Sayyidina Ali radiallahu and he reminds us beautifully that we have to do better in terms of tailoring our parenting because 
first of all, do not raise your children the way your parents raised you because they were born of a different time. So whatever you experienced as a child of your parents is not enough as, you know, to replicate. You can borrow from certain things that worked for you or that were pleasant, good memories, good rules that your parents showed and it worked for you and your siblings, sure. But if that's all that's informing your parenting and you're not reading books, you're not learning about children's temperaments, developmental stages, you know, that, that in the next, uh, I mean, look at the insight. Look at the insight that they gave us 1,400 plus years ago about the developmental stages of children that they're only now learning about, right? If you, can, if you know Eric Erickson's psychosocial development, you know, eight stages, it's all, it's subhanAllah reflecting the exact, you know, information that we had centuries ago. Play with your children till the age of seven. Why? Because this is, look at them, they're so sweet. This is the age of play. They're learning. This world is new. They've been thrust into the universe and everything is sensory. So they're just learning. They need to touch. They need to put things in their mouth. And sometimes we don't want them to, but that's how they know things, right? So let them play. But you know what? Play with them. Enter their world. You see some fathers who come home from work, they don't want to play with their children. I'm tired. And they'll go straight to their video games, computers, start working more, even though you just came from work. Let's just work. They don't want to get on the ground and sit and let's wrestle, let's play. You want to play Legos, you want to play Play-Doh. Mom, maybe if you're stay at home, you have to do it. You have no choice. You will go crazy, right, if you do not do that. Sometimes you're doing two things at the same time. You're cooking, you're flipping, you know, paratas and then also playing with the child or, or cooking rice and you're just doing all this stuff, but you have no choice because children demand our attention. So it goes to, uh, to both, but the point is, is we have to play with our children, enter their world, go into their playrooms. And I'm telling you, probably some of the sweetest parenting moments I've ever had in my life was when I did that. When I took a pause for my adult mind and brain and said, you know what, I just want to be a kid today. Let me go into the, my kid's room. And literally, and wallahi, sometimes I would get emotional because the, uh, the shock of my kids seeing me enter without invitation, they didn't invite me. They didn't say, mommy, come play with us. I would open the door. And I would just go sit on the floor. And they were like frozen, looking at me like, what are you doing here? Because <laughs> it, it wasn't as often as I would have liked it to be. But they were very pleasantly surprised when I said, I'm just here to play with you. Can I play with you? <gasps> you you want to play with us? Of course. And then, of course, mommy, so here's this guy. <laughs> I have two boys, so it was Legoland basically in my house. It still is. But the joy that would overcome them at seeing me wanting to enter their world. We have to do that as parents, right? So play with your children. Be silly. Be goofy. If you come ask my kids, they'll tell you a whole other side of Hosai that you guys wouldn't even know or think it exists. But yes, I am very goofy. I'm very, <laughs> uh, I do voices. I will get into character. I do it all. There's nothing really because I want them to uh, have fun. And and we can we can do that. Uh, mashallah, my my. Sister-in-law is here, so I'll just mention this about her. She's, mashallah, wonderful with children. May Allah bless her. But in addition to her, her husband, I always say, who's my brother-in-law, I say he's like a walking amusement park for kids. Because, mashallah, his ability to connect with children, especially, I mean, I've seen him mostly with boys, but he is just so fun. And my kids to this day, even though I have a 13-year-old who's almost, you know, six feet, they still get excited when Hamza Kaka's coming. Because they know it's going to be a lot of fun, you know. And he's like that with his own children. So, of course, he's going to be like that with children in general. Um, and so, hard, mashallah, amazing ability to connect, tell stories, read, do the same voices, play. You know, this is the kind of parenting philosophies that really work with young children. So do that more and get over your... Um, your cultural, you know, uh, added, sometimes it's just culture that tells us, oh, that's kind of silly, or but no, just, if the Prophet ﷺ could do it, who are we? He played with children. He let them crawl on his back. He would race. He would do things. So who are we? What, we're too cool? We're too adult? We're too mature? It's all ego. Be like him and you'll succeed. Discipline and teach them from the age of 7 to 14. This is the next level. So when they reach that age of seven, you're going to see an awakening that happens because 
they are starting to think about themselves and the world around them. And they do, you do start to see a little bit more maturity. So this is where giving them more tasks, giving them responsibilities, teaching them about their fara'id, right? Like what the, the wudu and then prayer, starting that process. And over time, solidifying that identity that I'm a Muslim too, that I pray just like mama and baba, that I make wudu, that I read Quran. All of that comes in that age of 7 to 14, right? And then befriend them at the age of 14 plus. So now as we're, you know, we're teaching in the middle and guiding, and then the befriending comes when they really need it. You know, our teens are going through a lot. They have a lot of uh, social and, and pressures that, that overwhelm them, and they need to know that their parents are a refuge, right? So if we are meeting them constantly with a litany of tasks that they have to do and responsibilities, and we don't really make time to connect and just say, hey, how are you? How's it going? Talk to me. And just, you know, hold them. You know, sometimes you'd be surprised. And I really want to say this for parents of boys because I have boys. But one of the destructive things about modern society is that it has created, you know, this, uh, I mean, it's, it's just something that's happened with boys around this age of, adolescence where emotionally they start to really shut down and they don't talk about what they're feeling because they are told or conditioned that in so in society they're conditioned by society to think that emotions are for girls right so boys just have to act tough and and bury all of it bury their insecurities bury their fears bury their anxieties because if you talk about it you're not a, you're not strong you're weak right you're like a girl that's really uh, the the insult that that boys receive. To be anything like a girl is an insult. It's horrible. But um, again, when you look at the Prophet Sallallahu and the way that he uh, nurtured this emotionality in even the youth, you know, there's that famous story of um, Umair who lost his bird and the Prophet Sallallahu you know, he was holding his bird and the Prophet Sallallahu went to him and he basically helped him reconcile and grieve over the loss of his pet. Like, you have permission to be sorry. You know, you have, I mean, feel sorrow and sadness. He didn't tell him, toughen up, what's wrong with you? It's just a bird, go bury it. You know, like some of our cultures do around these things. It's like, because you're a boy, you can't cry. A girl, sure, oh, poor girl. It's horrible to do that. Let our boys be human beings. They're not robots. So allowing them to be expressive towards you and inviting that is so essential as a parent. Inviting them to talk to you. So with my boys, we, you know, I do, and I have to do it again because I kind of had a hiatus, but I would do these, what we called mommy and son, like dates where we would go separately. So I would not take the family. I wouldn't take them as a unit. I would take them each separately and give them a total separate fun experience all for themselves so that they get undivided mommy or baba attention. And my husband did the same. It was both of us having to do it with each kid. And they loved it because it was like, I feel special. I feel seen. And it, you, you'll you love it too because you realize like I'm always speaking to more than one of you, you know. And it's nice to just see one of you and not worry about what the other one's doing right now. So to separate the kids is, is good, to, good to do. But that is essential at the age uh, of the later teen years. So now I kind of just go into similar, I mean, it's similar discussion is what I just said, but... We kind of want to know what young children need most. They need love, safety, and guidance. All of our kids, these are their primary needs right now when they're young, right? And the tools that we can do to inculcate the love of the Prophet ﷺ in, in our children is storytelling with animation. So we have to be more animated in our storytelling. We have to know those stories. Song and rhymes. You know, I, I'm, this is a shameless plug, but why not? I wrote a book called Clear the Path. Um, in a rhyme book for on manners for little Muslims. And the reason I wrote that book is because I worked with young children. I realized, like, wow, I could teach them all day about Allah and the Prophet and just lecture them, but it's not going <laughs> to stick. But if I sing to them anything, they'll remember. So I said, okay, we all want our children to have good manners. Why not give them a book on manners that rhymes? And it works, alhamdulillah, because they just wanted to sing their lyrics all day. But what were they singing about <laughs> being a good Muslim? So, you know, rhymes work. And you can um, make up your own songs. You don't have to cut and paste everything from a professional. Just be, make silly songs up. They'll, they don't care. They're the most receptive, amazing audience you can have as a young child. You could be tone deaf, have 
no rhyme skills whatsoever, have no musicality, but your young kids will go, yay, because you're, they just like to see you as not, you know, this adult, uh, and you're being willing to be silly. So do that stuff, and then model, you know, that's what they need, modeling. And then the second group, uh, or second developmental stage is that 8 to 11, what do they need? Love, of course, respect, and reassurance. This world becomes very scary at this age, because they're coming out of, as we say, like, the Garden of Eden, and they're now, because in, in Jannah, everything is great, it's rosy, it's amazing, right? But when you start to see and hear about things, like young you know, middle schoolers, this is where they hear stories from their par their friends about kidnapping and murders and, and, you know, like really dark themes. And so poor kids start to suddenly, you know, they get scared of the world. So they need a lot of reassurance and a lot of love and hugs and it's okay and dua. So get them in the habit of calling on Allah. If you're scared, if you're upset about something, just call on Allah. Allah's with you always. He'll always be there for you. He'll rescue you. And I can't tell you how many times, alhamdulillah, like, my son will come out of nowhere and he'll go, Mommy, Mommy. And, you know, he said, I had a headache and I, I was feeling so bad. And I made dua and I asked Allah, please get rid of my headache. And it's gone. And I'm like, of course, because your dua is mustajab. But they know to do that because we taught them, you, you're in pain. Make dua, Allah will take it away. So we have to teach that at this age so that they get in those good habits, right? And so what tools can we teach them with? Storytelling, of course, always works with kids at all ages. But now we want to move into those metaphors and analogies too. That's another really good tool to use because there are, um, you know, a lot of stories in the Qur'an are metaphorical, right? And lessons in the, in, in the Qur'an. And so, you know, that's that's the those are the types of stories that work. And also... Because they're in that age of um, seeing the the you know the the sort of dystopian nature of the world, the good versus evil, right? That's kind of the, what they begin to understand the world as. It's really good to expose them to like um, stories where of nobility, of valor, of like overcoming odds. So the battle stories of the Sira, for example, right? Like uh, Badr. Badr is an amazing story to tell children at this age because the numbers are so, like, incredible how they beat, right, uh, the, the mushrikeen, despite their low numbers, but because they had, um, you know, the, the, the Prophet them, obviously, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent helpers to them. All of that imagery needs to come through. So showing stories of overcoming hardships really speaks to this age because they're going through a lot of that internally. And then, of course, modeling the excellent behavior that we want with them. And in the final stage, you know, what do they need the most? Love, respect, and empathy. We need to empathize with our teens because they are going through a lot that we don't understand. And instead of judging them and expecting always the best gold standard of behavior at all times, always, we have to also figure out what's wrong. Why aren't they, for example, sluggish to come to prayer, right? Because a lot of, I, I get these questions all the time. My teen doesn't want to pray anymore. They, they, they don't want to come to the masjid. I'm frustrated. What do I do with them? Yes, I can understand to be frustrated by that because you want the best for your children. So you feel like they're standing in the way of that. But I would say find out why, what's going on. Maybe there's something that's happening. Maybe there's a classmate of theirs from school. You never know. Muslims go to the school together that they don't like to come see at the masjid because they have a history that you don't know about. you got to fish for what the core issue is. Do the investigation. Ask the right questions. Get to the core. Is there something, um, you know, a very good example, like my, my teen son, when he was maybe 11 or 12, he just flat out said, Mommy, sometimes in prayer I get distracted. Like, I can't really focus, you know? Um, and uh, instead of responding with that, with, like, shame, like, well, that's not good, and, and just start judging, you want to give them, you know, like, what's going on? Like, what are you thinking about? What, what are the things that come, come up for you? And, you know, sure enough, it's going to be the game that they have the next day or the, seeing their friends. You know, all the stuff that we adults also experience. We're always planning future events during our prayer. Allah, may Allah forgive us. So we just have to humanize them and say, okay, so let's come up with some tools of how you can be more focused. And so I told my son, for example, I said, this is what I want you to do. I mean, just if you feel, feel free to use this, but I said, I want you to, for every prayer, before you get in the prayer, think of a couple of things. One, one thing that you're grateful for, just one thing. One thing and one thing only. Do that. Two, think about the surahs you want to recite before you get in the prayer. Don't make those on, you know, as you're doing it. 
Because sometimes we just get in prayer immediately and then we're thinking of these things. But I said, if you're more intentional before the prayer, you'll find yourself more focused, right? And it worked for him, right? Um, and so the, it's just, these are little tools that we can teach them. But that's empathizing. Like, I get it. Your, your child, your brain is distracted easily. So let me help you rein that mind in by giving you tools instead of shaming because I want you to be perfect and you're not. And now I'm mad at you, which is what parents do. So how can we inculcate love of God and his messenger? Friendship and mentorship. It's really important that we extend also for um, other adults in their lives that can play that role of a mentor. Because there are there are adults, believe it or not, it happens. It's, hap it's happened to me before, and I've been on the other side of it, where the parent and their friend or this mentor will verbatim say the exact same thing to the child but they take it more from the mentor than they do for the parent. And for the parent, it's hard. It's hard on our hearts to see like, well, uh, uh, really? I've given you my whole life, and you're going to take this person's word? I said the same thing to you last week, and you didn't even believe me, right? But it's just the way it goes. And this is part of their um, actual natural you know, uh, development, because in this age, they are wired to start to separate from us, and it makes perfect sense. They eventually have to be like the bird that leaves the nest and fly on their own. So if there's always this tether to mom and dad, they will not learn to fly. So there is this kind of detachment that slowly begins in adolescence, and we have to be okay with that. Where That's why enlisting the help of trusted mentors is not seen as um, you know something that we should be territorial about. No, you're bringing them in to be uh, helpers along the way for you and your family. So look for those helpers, by the way, when they're young. Because trust me, time moves very quickly, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my God, I need some really good adults that I can trust my kids to. So forge those relationships when they're younger so that by the time they're older, that adult has already an established rapport with your child. But they need that mentorship. And they also need classes and experiences. Really important to bring your youth to classes with you. You know, do that. Figure it out. If this masjid has something that's for families um, and, you know, the, the offerings work for your family, mashallah. If it doesn't, guess what? Uh, we're in one of the blessed places in this entire planet in that we have so many masajids, so many incredible organizations doing a lot of good things. Do the work. Look up research. Go on threads. Ask, what are classes? My child is interested in this, in this, whatever it is. Find something, and if it doesn't exist, make it. Honestly, we got to go past this uh, idea that everything has to be done for us. It, taking initiative is imp important. And what is taking initiative? Saying, you know what? My child, for example, likes to do crafts. Okay, if you don't see a craft class, make a craft class. Call up your mom friends or your dad friends and say, let's do a workshop. And you know, I, I mean, I don't want to put it on Brother Bonier, but maybe MCC can host something like that for the parents to do together here. Uh, you could create a club environment where you do it regularly, or you could open up your home. You know, if it's that important to you to have your child connected with the masjid or the, the you know, your dean, then you need to come up with experiences for your child and don't just give up because they don't exist. Take the initiative and make it happen. Where there's a will, there's a way. And I've seen it happen before. Allah will give you tawfiq, inshallah. And then discussion and debate. This is a really important one, too, for our teens. We need to encourage our teens to think. We need to encourage our teens to push back on narratives. So if you don't know, for example, if you've never studied logic and the art of rhetoric, the art of public speaking, you need to learn. You should, and there are, by the way, classes, like there's Toastmasters, which offers classes which youth can also attend. So I've, I've attended a few, and you will see sometimes parents bringing their 12, 13, 14-year-old child, and I'm like, good for you, because if there's ever a class that your child will really benefit from, it is discussion and debate and public speaking. Put your youth, especially teens, I mean, I would say even pre-adolescents, in those opportunities to develop that skill set. Because when they're being bombarded with messages, as they are right now, but they don't have the words to defend themselves, that's when they get sucked in. But when you've given them the tools to say, wait a second, that's a logical fallacy. That's a flawed argument. I can prove you wrong. Guess what? They're not going to be falling into this or that path, you know, camp because they have the, the tools to see a lie um, and a distortion, right? 
for what it is because you've taught them. And if you don't know how to do it, guess what? There are a lot of online programs that teach logic. There are courses that you can take for yourself. There are books you can buy. There are, on, there are websites, uh, I mean, uh, YouTube videos that are free. It's all free. You don't even have to do anything. You don't have to pay anything. But it's, uh, I would, I mean, those are all available, but I really would suggest even pushing for it in your schools if you have the ability to talk to, um, you know, your school, if you're on the PTA or whatever, like, is there an opportunity to get public speaking for our kids? I want my, I want to train professionals to teach our children how to do this, and it, it will help them, inshallah. But these are things that we should also invite in our house. So around the dinner table, right, come up with good discussion topics. Why not? Instead of just sitting there and having the TV on, blaring in the background and watching horrible news out of some, you know, whatever, CNN or Fox or whatever people watch, or um, silent dinners, you know, or everybody's scrolling on their phone, it's tragic. We don't invite discussion. We can, if you have a prepared list of topics, maybe, you know, it could be like a, uh, you know, a box that you, everybody just pulls from every night and see, okay, what's the debate today? You know, um, and you'll, it's honestly so exciting to see uh, everybody take a different position because every, you know, that's what a debate is. Okay, what's your position? Even if they don't believe it, they still have to defend it and then watch them. They have a lot of fun. You know, like, should school uniforms be implemented? That's a good one for, for kids. If you have, you know, children, you'll see that, like, arguments are really fun because they come up with some, some great uh, ideas. But it's just innocent topics like that. So uh, have that as a family offering. Now, the common parenting struggles, because we talked about the dangers and the struggles, but we should know what they are for each uh, stage two, right? So in that early years, the pressures that a lot of us feel is to be the perfect parent. We're being judged very heavily, microscopically by parents, grandparents, in-laws, with your first child, right? First children are always like, oh, what are you doing? Don't do that. Don't do this. And, and you're like, wait, a, I just need to figure my own rhythm, please. But because we feel so much pressure, um, what happens is, of course, it's mentally, physically exhaust, exhausting, but sometimes we we tend to lose our own identity, our own voice. Um, and so some people will just give in to, okay, fine, I'll do this way, I'll do that way. And you lose your own ability to think. So that can definitely wear you down. Um, and then if, if both husband and wife are also um, not communicating, right, with each other and on the same page, then there's a fracture in their bond. So it's now compounded. It's like I'm exhausted from parenting this child and then I don't have a supportive parent or co-parent. And it just all starts to fall apart. So we have to know that and prepare ourselves. How do we deal with that, right? How, first of all, nobody's perfect. Nobody. We've all messed up. We all make mistakes. And that's fine. We're human beings. Um, so get rid of this notion that you have to be a model perfect parent always. And then also deal with manager exhaustion. For the mothers, I will speak because I know for myself and a lot of the, the women that I work with, we, um, part of this narrative of perfect parent is to be the martyr, right? Because we're holding ourselves to the standard of our mothers and grandmothers. They had 10 children. They never complained. They had three hot meals. They did it all. They didn't do anything wrong. They were perfect. So then we feel, because sometimes our own mothers may say that, oh, really? You didn't cook dinner today? <laughs> You're going to go and have, you know, dinner outside, wow, you know, and they'll make those little comments, and so then you feel like you're the biggest loser mom, wife, right, in the world. No, you're not. You're perfectly in the right to, to say, I don't wish to cook today. I'm, I'm going to take a day off. The, the, you know, the oven doesn't need to be on every day, all day. Um, and so just own your own mind, and don't let people get in, right, um, because they, you'll never satisfy every, anybody. They always have something to nitpick about. So you just have to stop trying to do it all. Give yourself space. And I'm going to ask the, the husbands who are watching also to recognize that if you have a woman, I mean a wife, excuse me, who's staying at home and taking care of her children all day, morning to night, the mental toll that that takes, as much as we love our children, it's, it's a product of the modern world that's not very healthy. Because in traditional societies, there are multiple hands, multiple adults always around to kind of, you know, hand off. Like, I need to go do this, I need to go do that. When women cannot even use the restroom for more than five minutes without a hand slipping under the door or a door wide open, it's, it's a real clear sign of we've got some <laughs> major imbalance to correct. 
So I ask that the husbands please come in when you come from work and even if it's just 20, 30 minutes, offer a break. Like, I got this. You go do whatever you need. Do you want to go take a shower after five days? Please do, right? Uh, you want to go, like, take a walk outside sometimes? That's all it is. I just want to go out without a leg, you know, someone pulling my leg, right? Or crying their head off for why am I leaving? No emotional, like, manipulation, please, right before we get out the door. Um, or just want to go take a drive or go to the garage. I don't know, whatever you want to do. But just offer your wives, please, when you see her frazzled and she's just snipping, uh, snippy and, and giving really short answers, that means she's uh, the pressure cooker is about to hit that what peak boil where the whistle is coming on, right? We know the whistle, like, ah! like the alarm is about to go off. So just turn it off and say, I got this. And inshallah, may Allah reward you when you do that. When she comes back, she will be renewed, right? I'm telling you, I would t sometimes take 10, 15 minutes breaks, and I'm like, all right, I'm ready to get back into it. I feel like completely rejuvenated just from a small break. Because we end up missing our children, by the way, when we're taking a walk <laughs> and, and uh, you know, whatever we're doing. We're thinking about them. It's crazy, but alhamdulillah. So offer that. And that's for the, when, when they're young. Now, when they move into the middle ages, academic pressure becomes the next set of pressures that we worry about, right? What grades are they getting? Are they in every program? Do they know how to code? Someone told me recently that they, they put their two-year-old in a coding class. Wallahi. Okay. I mean, two years old, coding? I don't know. Do they even know what the word coding is? I don't know. Uh, can they say the word coding? But you know what? If you're putting that kind of pressure on yourself because you're trying to compete with the Silicon Valley model of like, you know, I don't know, perfect uh, students. And I know that there is a lot of worry about these things, but they'll be fine. You know, you have to kind of pull uh, back a little bit and say, the most important thing I can do for my children is secure their identity. If they have a strong identity and then, you know, working obviously to develop their mind, but that's more important, that their identity is strong as, as Muslims. And then behavior concerns and social aptitude. A lot of parents worry about their children's, you know, whether or not they're going to have so strong social skills. So those are the things that we have to um, mitigate before we enter these phases. Because what happens oftentimes is we go into crisis mode because we didn't foresee these things, and then we find ourselves dealing with them, and now we're in a panic. This is my constant... I've had parents all the time coming to me in a panic state. What do I do? My child is doing this. What do I do? My child is doing that or not doing this. And so we have to prepare ourselves with um, the understanding that they will have, you know, that they may have certain challenges and how can we deal with them. And that's what I was saying earlier, having those mentors in place, looking at, you know, um, paying attention to their moods, to just being really attentive. Empathy. Empathy is so critical to, uh, to being effective as parents. We have to be paying attention always. And I'll, I'll, I'll give you a quick example just that happened to me earlier today. So I've been very busy in Ramadan, as we all have, alhamdulillah, not complaining, but it's been a constant juggling act. And in that, yes, my children at times are like, hello, do you see me? Um, and so my son today, he's 13, he wanted to, as I was getting ready to come here, he wanted to just have some time with mommy but it was very quick because I was putting on my hijab, I was getting ready, and I was kind of like moving fast. And he stood very patiently kind of behind me waiting for what? He was waiting for a hug, right? And after a long time, I realized what he was waiting for. And he was like, I, I just basically waiting for a hug. So then I gave him a hug, but because I was panicking about being late, it was one of those, okay, thanks, bye, you know? And then he, he felt like I could tell, like, really, that's it? I waited all that time for you? And now you're rushing out the door, and I barely, like, it was a two-second hug. So I was, I just was in mode of, like, I got to get out because I'm going to be late. So I got into the car, and I sat, and then I realized what I had done. I just crushed his, his spirit, you know, because he felt, I could tell he was emotional. So then I, we have the home pod, you know, where you can do an intercom through the phone. So I just, I asked him, I said, can you please come back out to the car? Um, and so he came back to the car. And he came on the passenger side. He opened the door. He's like, did you need anything? I said, no, 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 come on this side. And as he's walking around the car, I could see that he, he kind of knew what was about to happen. Like, she did see me after all, you know. And so I opened the door, and I said, come here. And then I hugged him, and I said, I'm really sorry, and I'm, I'm going to give you, um, I just made it up. I said, I'm going to give you some Uma, 
later. And he was like, what? Like, what's that Uma? And I said, undivided mommy attention. I said, I will give you Uma later, I promise you. And, uh, and he was just really happy, I could tell. But that was because the empathy kicked in for me a little later than it should have, that I had hurt him, you know, that he was waiting patiently. He just wanted a hug. Um, and so, alhamdulillah, these are the kinds of things that we have to pay attention to. When you see your child, like, walking off kind of abruptly, is closing the door in a bit of a, with a bit of a tone, don't dismiss that as an attitude problem. That is not an attitude problem. That is a cry for help. That is a, I am feeling something, and you're not, you're not picking up on it, and I have no other recourse, so I'm just going to run. So if you can be perceptive and not personalize everything, then what you do is you say, I need to go open that door and investigate like what's going on. And it takes a lot of self-awareness to do that. It's not easy. We all fall short, may Allah forgive us, but the more we do it, the more our bond with our children will be, will be stronger. So then the teen adolescent years, you know, we have to remember they're departing from childhood. They have that worry, that natural angst of adolescence. Um, we worry about the attitude issues, detachment from family, their friends and social circles. Are they mixing with good friends, bad friends? Obviously, that they're exploring the risky behaviors that we're all deathly afraid of, our kids knowing about, the online social media usage, rebellion, resistance to authority, faith struggles. These are the, probably the biggest things that I get asked about as a, you know, I mean, I'm sure all of our teachers do from parents is how do I protect my child from their iman. What if they what if they go astray or they may be going astray? I don't know what to do. Um, and then their future success. So if we can see the worries ahead of time, that's why it's it's kind of like preempting, right? I see these worries. I know that they're real because everybody's experiencing this. What am I going to do to prevent me from falling into this, right? Or our family from being affected by these things? What measures can I take now? So if you have younger younger children, pay attention because this is likely going to be a concern for you in a few years. And if you have older children, it's never too late. We don't um, despair, right? Islam is not a deen of despair. It's actually haram to despair, because you're losing hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you despair. So what you do is you raise your hands in dua, first and foremost, and you ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, protect my child if they are in X, Y, and Z, uh, doing X, Y, and Z, whatever it is that you're you know, feeling um, really worried about. Ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to, to protect them and to guide them out of, uh, out of that. And then, excuse me, then um, in addition to that, look for those helpers. Seek out help. We have uh, individuals, but we also have organizations that work with youth that can help you. And really be persistent. If you keep knocking on the door, someone's going to open. So inshallah, be persistent. Look for those mentors. Look for those helpers. And read there are a lot of people that, that have already worked all these things out and they have really good guidance. Someone I could uh, think off, off the top of my head that I really advise you to know about is Dr. Leonard Sachs. He's not Muslim, but mashallah, his, he's really ahead of the conversation. And he has great content for parents of boys and girls on how to preempt a lot of these problems and crises that youth are going through. So get his material. He has a lot of free stuff online too. Uh, but he's he's phenomenal. So I would say him right off the top of my head. And then the greatest threats, right? Shaitan, nafs, bad company, media, pop culture, internet, social media. These are the things that we really have to worry be worried about because they are everywhere. And um, and then solutions we have to teach their faith properly, how to protect themselves, model the behavior, empower them with strong and effective tools in their toolkits like emotional intelligence, right? Which we'll get to in a moment. And build their confidence, encourage trust, communicate effectively, identify their strengths and, and weak, weaknesses by temperaments. All of that knowledge, those tools that you build for your children early on are going to help them when things fall apart to, to repair and to, to build. And so that was the end of session three. Do you want to take a, I'm sorry, because I mentioned in the beginning for those who joined us late, because this was a four-part series, but we only are doing these sessions for three weeks, we are squeezing two of the parts together. So this is a bit of an extended class, and I'm going to try to move as quickly as possible, because I know we, we're, we've gone on already for a while. But do you want to pause for Q&A, or do you want to just zip through the rest and then do one final q and I'll leave it up to the audience here. Yes. Thank you. Just like a little 
Um, so, uh, Alhamdulillah, so I have three kids and they're in the range, like all three of these ranges. So eight, uh, 10, 12 and 14, mashallah. mashallah. And I think like during the pandemic, I really had trouble with their whole like growing up phase, like that detachment mm. phase and not taking it personally. That was really hard for me and I'm yeah. still trying to adjust with that. But anyway, I mean, do you have any books that you recommend for, you know, dealing with this and kind of understanding temperaments and also that books that give solutions, like how to address these things? Right. Right. Mashallah. No, very good question. I think a lot of parents in COVID had a very similar uh, experience because the pressure of, of just being away from their peer group um, caused a lot of kids to shut down emotionally. And that was immediately experienced by the parents and their family, right? So it's a very common experience that a lot of people had. As far as books, one book that I do can remember right now is The, the Temperament That God Gave You. It's, um, gosh, I can't remember the, te the authors, but it's a husband and wife. Um, they wrote that book. And so that's a good book just to get started on knowing about temperament theory. As far as, um, you know, how to, uh, to, you know, kind of, deal with these with these situations. I can't think of anything off the top of my head in terms of resources, but I think having, um, there's a, um, I got a book for my boys. It was like a mommy and son journal that had prompts and questions. It's already done for you. And it was a nice way. We, we started it. We still have a long ways to go, but um, where sometimes it's hard to verbalize what you're feeling, but writing actually does become cathartic for even kids if they learn to channel those emotions. And so an exercise like that where it's like, hey, because it's like a handoff. You write your portion and then you give it to them and then they answer the questions and the prompts. So it's not coming from you. It's kind of like you have a third person there, you know, <laughs> talking to both of you in a, in a weird way. But I think that's, things like that are helpful when you want to reach your children who seem to be standoffish. Because Verbal communication is not easy for everyone. And that's why when we go back to temperament, you'll realize the last two um, temperaments are the phlegmatic and the um, melancholic. They tend to be less, you know, ver verbal. And so they feel, but they don't really verbalize their emotions as much. So if you have children with those temperaments and you're more gregarious and like, I just, I'm really, I, I want to talk it all out you may feel like you're failing to reach them, but it's not that. It's that their temperament is different than yours. You like immediate, on-the-spot verbal communication. For them, that might be a little too threatening because they don't have the words. It's not that they don't feel things. They just don't have the words. So I opt for written communication when you have that type of dynamic because it allows them to, at their own pace, in their own time, if they want to do it later in their bedroom without eyes watching them, to like, and then, you know, sometimes with siblings around too, it's like weird to like talk because you're like, are they listening? So, I mean, I, just to, uh, like with my boys, I'm very clear about privacy and respect of boundaries. So when any of them, either of them want to talk to me privately and the other one comes into the space, I will say to them, or my other son will say to them, we're speaking privately, can you please leave? And Alhamdulillah, there's no issue because they both are respectful of that boundary. So they just leave. And then they know to never ask questions like, what did you guys talk about? Or or I even do worse, which is to be suspicious and try to stand by the door and listen. They don't do that because they know it's a sacred trust that mom has with her child. And just like, I'm going to offer it to you at another time. You want that to be respected, right? So you need to reciprocate. So we can, you know, show our children that, that respect of, if you tell me something, it's trust, you know, I'm a safe space for you and I'm not going to go share it with even your, you know, I mean, unless it's, it's really serious, but I'm not going to share it with even Baba or Mommy if it's something you're tr entrusting me with, right? So creating that kind of sa safe space, I think, is a good invitation for them to open up, but also try the, the journaling sure. between Mommy and, and Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Thank you for staying. So should we go forward? I feel like zipping through the rest and then I can open it up and breathe a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah? Okay. So let's get to the rest, inshallah. Thank you, Brother Munir. Jazakallah khairan. And if you have to leave, I totally understand. I've, uh, it's, a, it's a long session. So session four, the theme is active parenting. Um, so uh, the first one was intentional parenting. The second was prophetic parenting. 
The third session, which we just covered, was balanced parenting. And now the final session is active parenting, right? And I closed on this one because this is the takeaway. We need to leave these sessions with something of action, right? So active parents are those who know that they cannot give up, right? No matter how hard it gets, they have to persevere for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because it's not about being perfect, it's about trusting Him. So as much as you feel exhausted and tired and, oh my God, I can't do this anymore. I had someone just uh, yesterday uh, mention this, that they're just, they're so overwhelmed, they just want to quit throwing the towel. We can't, right? So we look at here are some models from the Qur'an because this whole you know, session or this whole series was on Quranic parenting. So I'm going to bring it back full circle, go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, where we learn directly from our prophets who are our examples. The story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam teaches us what? About the importance of submission to God's will. Although Prophet Nuh did everything possible to guide his family, things didn't go as planned, and he had to face the reality that his wife and one of his sons was, were disbelievers, and he had to accept that and, and, and move on. And so sometimes you may find, may God never test us um, with that, but if you find that your child has reached a point where you can't do anything further, remember the story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. Continue to make dua and do what you can, but also submit to the will of Allah and realize you cannot control everything. But the best thing that you can do is make dua for your child and keep the door open. The next, I'm sorry the, the font is so small on these, I apologize. But this is uh, also another important model that we can look at, which is the story of Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam, right? Because his story teaches us the importance of making sacrifices for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that when we do, it will always pay off, just as it did for him with a beautiful renewed relationship between him and his son, right? When he was uh, told to sacrifice his son, I mean physically, literally sacrifice his son, um, and he was willing to do it because he had that strong yaqeen in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, then Allah showed him, right, the, 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 the re reward of that type of submission. Um, and so some sacrifices you may have to do for the sake of Allah, for your children's well-being or, you know, for that bond, but there's immense reward in that. And so we can learn again about the importance of sacrificing for the sake of Allah. And then the story of Prophet Yaqub alayhi salam, Again, another incredible model um, from, from the Qur'an. He taught us about dealing with larger family dynamics, right? Keeping trusts, helping to bring balance in difficult situations. And he showed us immense patience because he was so patient, right? Sabrun Jamil we get from, from the story of Yaqub alayhi salam. To have beautiful patience in the va face of tribulation. So if you're tested, may God not test us with our children, whatever that is. To show beautiful patience, it is, there's immense reward. And to be able to manage your emotions, right? Um, despite all of the, uh, you know, just treachery and dysfunction around you is a skill that we can all learn. But by way of example of Prophet Yaqub, we can learn that. Um, and then the story of Asya, radiallahu anha. We have to remember she was married to a tyrant, right? But she put her trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then raised one of her children to become a prophet of God. So if your marriage isn't ideal, and I say this because I know there are a lot of broken marriages that are still staying together for the sake of the children, but if you're in a relationship where you're miserable, I mean, aside from abuse, right, that, that's an exception. We should never endure that type of uh, abuse. But if you feel like you're, you're having a difficult marriage, for, uh, first of all, seek help, try to um, to seek the help you need to come out of that, but sometimes our partners don't want to, uh, you know, work on themselves, and so you have to kind of make that decision to stay with someone who might not be the best practicing Muslim, who might not always be on the same page as you, right? And if that's your you know circumstance, and you want to borrow some strength from Asya, because having a difficult partner, having a partner who's not spiritually on the same page, is very different than having a a diabolical tyrant as a husband, but she did that, right? She was she managed to work around his massive ego, and yet raise a, a, a son who was not hers, but who became one of the prophets of God. Why? Because of her faith. It was no other reason but her faith in Allah. So channel that uh, strength, right? 
and that and so she's a wonderful example and then of course the story of Maryam alayhi salam or radiallahu anha uh, because she was completely inexperienced thrown into parenting right without any experience whatsoever any preparation whatsoever huge shock to her and then she had to endure scandal right and and all of the things that she went through but despite all of that the inexperience and all the pushback from everyone else she also managed to raise a prophet of God. How? Faith. Faith is what helps us succeed. It's not going to be anything else. Nobody else can come to our rescue or help except for God. So if you maintain your faith and your connection to Him, whatever the circumstance you are in, you will succeed because you are. Uh, he is with you and He's always with you. Now, I mentioned emotional intelligence earlier, and this is a framework I talk about a lot. You might have heard me speak about this many times, so I don't want to belabor it, but I do think for those of you who've never heard it before, it is an important framework that can really help us to understand prophetic wisdom, right? Um, and so what is EI? It is the ability to identify and manage your emotions as well as the emotions of others. And this is important because emotions actually precede our thoughts, right? This is why we're, when we're in highly emotional situations, it can impair our brain function, right? Uh, we, we don't always think with a rational mind, and we sometimes can, um, you know, uh, we can cause things to become worse, right? Because our, our cognitive abilities and de decision-making powers are compromised. So emotional intelligence was coined back in the 90s by John Mayer and Peter Salovey. They introduced it, and they wrote about it, and it kind of changed the understanding of how we define intelligence. But then Daniel Goleman came along later, and he developed it into a book that became instantly famous, millions of copies sold, and it changed the entire conversation on how we define intelligence, because prior to that, it was IQ. It was always measuring people's uh, spatial abstract ability, you know, mathematical skills, whatever, those types of things, and then we'd give them a number, and it's like, oh, you're smart. But they were like, no, actually, intelligence isn't, that left brain function alone. There's a whole other aspect of intelligence that we have to know about. So it was a revolutionary pa paradigm shattering idea when it first was, um, you know, when it was first exposed. And, you know, and I thought it was interesting too that he wrote another article based on these findings called What Makes a Leader. So he's showing us not only that this is in there, in in in, in, 1990, in the 1990s, this was paradigm shattering and revolutionary. But also identifying that effective leaders have emotional intelligence, right? So when I started to explore EI, I was like, they're totally talking about the Prophet Sallallahu Everything they're describing is in him, embodied in him. So for them, it was revolutionary. Right, but not for us, and so that's why I started to teach about it. But these are the three skills of emotional intelligence that we will look to to get, which are awareness, regulation, and management. And the acronym for this is an arm. So think of a strength, like it's a skill that you develop and you strengthen, just like you would like your muscle. So to be aware of your emotions, to regulate them, and then to manage the emotions of other people. And so these are the qualities that when you're studying emotional intelligence, you study or you you. This is the order. You become self-aware, so you the temperaments that we talked about. What is your temperament? What are uh, what uh, another factor of your personality that people don't look at is birth order. Birth order absolutely impacts our our temperaments and our personalities because we are ushered into roles by way of the birth. Right? Like if you're a firstborn, anybody here firstborn, the oldest in your siblings. So you typically are parentified early. You have a lot of responsibilities, right? Because you're the model oldest one for everybody else to follow. So you end up being hyper-wired to, uh, to just be dutiful and responsible. But that can also take a toll, right, on you. Uh, because it's, as you see, your siblings get away with everything. There's a lot of resentment, right? Like, wait a second, I didn't have that luxury when I was their age, right? So this affects your, affects your relationship with your parents, your siblings, everything. And then also in partner selection, because we tend to mirror, uh, you know, partners that kind of mirror us. So you may also find another kind of type A intense personality in your, in your spouse. But middle children are known to be, any middle children, we're completely forgotten. Like, does anyone see me at all, right? I'm, and so what happens, our struggle, because we're, and I'm not technically the middle, but I felt like I was the middle. Um, but anyway, middle children are 
they're lost and they tend to be people pleasers. So we end up actually, because we're so eager for validation, nobody cares about anything we do or say because the oldest ones get first dibs and the babies whine and get their way. So then nobody cares what we want for dinner. Nobody cares. It's already decided. It's pizza or it's <laughs> whatever, right? So the middle child gets lost, but then in their relationships, they start to seek that out in other people. So they'll, they'll become people pleasers. And we have to really know that about our children. So if you see your child always eagerly trying to do everything, always giving up things for other people, even in their friends group, take them, you know, show them, I mean, have some conversations with them that if they keep doing that, they will be taken advantage of because people can be pretty ruthless. But that's just one other small addition to the self-awareness puzzle, right? There's so much more to that. Love languages. You should know your love language. Do you receive love through gifts, through quality time, through acts of service, through physical touch, through words of affirmation? What is the way that you receive and give love? Teach that to your family. This is how we become self-aware. And these are the nuanced things about uh, each of us separately, but specifically uh, to become self-aware is to know your aqidah, to know who Allah is, to know who your creator is, to know what your purpose is. That is, all of us need to know those things, right? So self-awareness is just so much there, but um, that's, the, that's the starting point. And then you move on to self-regulation. How can I control myself? How can I not be explosive and impatient and angry and give in to my desires constantly and indulge every whim and desire? That's where tazkiyat the nafs comes from, right? Purification of the soul, purification of the heart, the tongue. So self-regulation kind of makes you, you know, uh, practice willpower, which is what we're doing right now. We're all fasting. And this is why Allah in his infinite wisdom imposed the month on us and made it, you know, one of the pillars and uh, to teach us that we can do this and we should do this because we become much better people when we suppress those appetites and we have control over those emotions, right? We just become nicer. We become, over time anyway, you know, after you get over the initial um, shock of it all, you just become a more subdued person, and then your soul can emerge and you start to see uh, the priorities in life. So that's what happens when you self-regulate. And then motivation, empathy, and social skills, all of them build upon each other. So you start with self-awareness, then you go into self-regulation, then you become a naturally motivated people because you have a project yourself. You're working on yourself. You have an assignment, which is I need to constantly be better and better. And who are you comparing yourself to? The Prophet I said him. So as you're motivated, then you move outward. You're now looking at other people, which is where the empathy kicks in, right? Like, I need to be more considerate of other people, right? I need to... Um, you have not reached the perfection of faith until you love for your brother or sister what you love for yourself, right? So empathy is really coming into terms with that and, and becoming more aware of other people's uh, feelings and emotions. And then social skills is navigating different groups of people. So you can, for example, our children should be able to talk with adults. You know, if you have a child who freezes with adults, we need to have some conversation. Get him around some adults that they don't feel terrified around and have those adults be engaging with them. Talk, And if you have, that's where those healthy mentors early on can really help because a good mentor for your children is someone who talks to your children. Like, how are you? Talk to me. Give them attention. That's a good friend. Because if you have friends who just bypass your children and just see you, they're a good friend to you, but they shouldn't ignore your children because your children are a part of you as well, right? So they should honor your children too. May Allah make us do that. But we should know how to navigate those relationships with non-Muslims, how to be respectful, boundaries, teach ourselves first of all these skills, but then our children. So all of these are important. And then um, FYI, because I mentioned earlier that you know, this concept of emotional intelligence was revolutionary in the 1990s. This is a hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. He is putting them two together, 1400 plus years ago, that reasoning, intelligence, after the basis of it after the faith in God, right? If you're, you've, you've demonstrated that you're an intelligent person if you believe in God. After that, it's can you manage human emotions and, and relationships, right? Loving kindness towards people. So he's putting them two together, that it is actually a higher form of intelligence. And that's why he is the most emotionally intelligent human being ever, because, um, you know, he, he's perfected all of these virtues. And then we also know, man arafa nafsu faqad arafa rabbahu, which means that the one who knows him or herself knows their Lord. So self-awareness is absolutely integral 
to our path, and we have to teach this to our children. And then, you know, the Prophet ﷺ, just, these are just examples for us all to think about when we examine our own emotional intelligence and also teach our children that he was always of cheery disposition, easygoing and compassionate. What does that teach you? He, t I mean, tell you, it tells you right away that he had control of himself. He could control his emotions. Don't think that the Prophet ﷺ didn't suffer. He had an entire year of suffering. He had more loss than we can even fathom. But when he would meet people, smile. That's a person in control of himself because I don't need to burden everybody with my problems. These are my problems, my tests between me and Allah, and I'm going to meet people with beauty, with welcome, you know, uh, like warmth, right? So smiling is a sunnah, um, and he. This is how. And then he was not boorish or coarse or ruckus or vulgar or critical. Subhanallah. He had empathy. He didn't, uh, you know, disparage people. He didn't. He wasn't mean to people. He wasn't rude to people. He didn't overpraise or jest, so he had balance. He wasn't going in one extreme or the other. And he ignored that which he disliked. He was he could control himself. He didn't have to point it out and criticize things. He just didn't say anything at all. He would not dash the hopes of anyone who hoped for something from him. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Constant empathy, constant caring of the hearts and souls of other people, and they would not be disappointed. He withheld from himself three things. This is exactly what self-regulation is. He didn't debate. He didn't waste his time on that. He didn't. Ex he was never excessive, and he also left alone that which didn't concern him. He, mi he minded his own business, um, and this is something we, these are the adab of our deen. Like, we need to go back to this, you know, um, one of the, the reminders that, that I recently um, also received but it's important to mention is now, you know, we're in Ramadan. Some of us may be going to other people's homes for iftar, right? When you're in other people's homes, it's really important that you respectfully move about the house. You know, if you're just walking in any room that you want, even if it's your family or siblings, there is, you know, a lack of consideration because the home is a private space, right? So one of the adabs is that you do not um, basically, uh, you know, go into other people's private spaces or even look and try to, sometimes people are nosy and they can't help themselves. They're looking for things or making assumptions based on things, you know. Uh, don't do that because that's not minding your own business. So minding your own business is a very important principle in Islam, right, that we, uh, we just basically leave things that are none of our concern alone. So don't inquire, don't be intrusive, don't pry, don't ask excessive questions about things or people. Just If someone wants to give you information, fine, but you don't need to further explore things just out of curiosity, right? And he withheld from the people three things. He would never criticize or disparage anyone. He wouldn't seek to shame anyone, and he would not speak about anything unless he hoped to be rewarded by Allah for it. So his motivation was clear. He was always motivated by the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and that's how he was always. This is by Sayyidina Ali. I mean, always of cheery disposition. you got to think, like, subhanAllah, that takes immense control. But he's our example. So I'm going to now just kind of zip through this because I, I, I talked about these uh, a lot, and I don't want to keep uh, repeating more. But, you know, the, the self-regulation, motivation, um, empathy, and social skills. So... Those are, and you can learn more. I've, I've given a lot of talks on, on that. It's available online if you want to learn more about emotional intelligence. But the gist of it is basically the prophetic example. If you follow him, if you look at his teachings, his sunnah and sirah, for yourself first and foremost, and then apply that to your children and teach your children as well, you will find that, inshallah, they will naturally inculcate these virtues of balance that we want them to have and, and you know, all the beautiful virtues, control, courage, wisdom, justice, right? All of these things that we want them to have. And so the final uh, message, yeah, I know she's done, I'm done, we're all done. We're, we're going to end soon. <laughs> the final message that we uh, wanted to leave is to not never forget that we do not control outcomes. Everything is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he tells us that uh, we will be tested in our relationships with our children, our spouses, our lives, our wealth. So we have to just let go of control and this will help us a lot when we um, just kind of foresee that part of being in the dunya is that we're going to be tested. And as long as um, we are aware of that, then we keep asking Allah to, for protection from those tests. But when they come, we recognize that they are from Him. 
and that we have to bear the, the test with patience. And that's where good company, good teachers, beautiful communities like MCC and other places that where you can come and you find community here that can help you and support you is so important. So attach yourself to the house of Allah, make good friends, because you know it's inevitable that we're going to be tested. But um, we can also come out of those tests, as many people have before, succeeding if we have these things in place. So just do your best, try your hardest, and make a lot of dua. Make dua from the, the depths of your soul. Get up um, and you know cry to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Show Him that you're in need of Him. Wake up for tahajjud. Give up your sleep. You know you can always nap in, in the day or find a way to nap in the car if you have to. But don't, um, don't squander the, the blessed times to connect with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So tahajjud uh, and early in Fajr, recite Qur'an. The Qur'an that's recited at Fajr is witnessed. There's a lot of practices that we need to be doing to connect our hearts with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But if you really, really want uh, anything from Him, then mean it and then follow it with action. It can't just be a desire in your heart, but then there's no action. And give, um, you know, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is a time of, of uh, immense opportunity for us to reap the benefits. The Prophet ﷺ was the most generous during the time of Ramadan, so if you really, inshallah, want good for your family, then be willing to give up your comforts for the sake of other people's comforts. And inshallah, Allah, as He's promised is true, if you're grateful, I will increase you in blessings. And the way we show our gratitude is by paying it forward, right? We are very, very blessed. We have a lot of wealth. We're living abundant, luxurious lives. There are a lot of people who are suffering who do not have what we have. But if we think of others, right, um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward us and He will manage our worries and our concerns and rid us of the burdens that consume us because we are um, doing exactly as He tells us to do, which is to think outside of ourselves and to put our trust in Him. So, alhamdulillah. And remember, finally, that your children are the property of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to do everything to return them to Him with a clear conscience. We want our children to go back to Allah, precious, pure, sound, strong, fortified believers. And it's our job to do that, and we uh, we need Allah's help. We can't do it without, without Him. Uh, but if that's your intention with your children, may Allah give you tawfiq, inshallah, and protect you and your families. I thank all of you for tuning in. Those of you who are watching live stream, and those of you who came out uh, for the past few weeks, and uh, barakallah fikum for your support. And thank you to Brother Munir and the entire MCC Awesome team for coordinating and helping us to put these programs together, inshallah. We're going to be entering the last 10 nights of Ramadan, so this will be the final session. But please don't forget us in your dua. And remember uh, that you know these are the days of maghfirah, so ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive us. Any mistakes I've made are my own. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again reward all of you. Jazakumullah khairan. Um, we'll inshallah end on in dua, and then we can open it up for any questions if there are any. Uh, so bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wa la asr inna al-insan la fi khusr. إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواسوا بالحق وتواسوا بالصبر سبحانك اللهم وبحمدك شهد أن لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ومولانا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا الحمد لله جزاكم الله خيرا again everyone الحمد لله so now we can pause for Q and A if there are any last questions إن شاء الله or comments or anything Yes, Assalamu alaikum. Um, I was, uh, I'm kind of like, uh, as you see, my little two girls. Right. I'm trying to uh, make them be friend and good to each other. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't work. And then, you know, they try to fight each other. <laughs> so if you can uh, sure. give us an answer for that. It's Thank a very you. good question. I think uh, when you see the emotions between your the, the, your children who are close in age kind of boiling up, um, it's likely that one of them, you know, may uh, feel territorial, right? Because it's usually has to do with toys, food, right? They're feeling not safe that their sibling is going to take something from them, right? And it's hard to always manage and look, watch them at all times. I, I remember with my kids as well. But I think if we have a, some boundaries in place, for example, like maybe what you can do is have, like um, give your, the, 
your oldest one especially because she's the one who's going to have to learn to model the correct behavior for the younger one, right? And the younger one will follow along. But if your older one feels that you are respect that you are aware of what her concerns are, like maybe she has certain toys that she doesn't want to share, and that's okay. Okay, let her have like some toys that are just hers, right? And you can say, okay, you and I will play with these when the little one's not here. But for sh toys that she's willing to share, right, y let her be in control of that. So tell her which of these toys, for example, are you okay with sharing with your sister? And let her tell you, right, that I like this one she can share. I don't care about that one. But this one's my special toy. And if she feels like she really does not like it, honor that, right? Because sometimes we think, no, 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 you have to share everything, you have to share everything. In certain cases, but you, she has to also learn that her boundaries are being respected, right? So it's a boundary issue for her at this point. And she's also young, so it's hard to rationalize when they're so young. Like, okay, it's not a big deal, it's a toy. You know, you can't do that. So you kind of want to work with the boundary of saying, okay, I respect your boundary. I get it that that's a very special doll to you, and you think that your younger sister is going to maybe bite it off or something, right? So if you empower her with the choice to make the decision of what she's willing to share and what she isn't, Inshallah, she won't feel as threatened when her sister comes into her play, right? Or same with food. Like, and with young children, I've always found that letting them make the decisions is much better than telling them what to do. So instead of saying, no, don't do that, or, or do, just say, which of this can you share? Because now they're confronted with a choice that they have to make as opposed to, the binary yes and no, right? Don't do that, do this, right? That's very hard for a child because it doesn't, it feel, they feel lost, like you're not giving them what they want. But if you empower them and say, okay, you have, you know, three cookies or whatever it is that you've given them, which of these foods can your sister share? Now she's going to think about it and it, it's going to be like, oh, well, I have the control. So I get to tell her what to do, right? And it changes her entire perspective. And hopefully she'll be more willing to see herself as an older, like, you know, guide for her younger sister, as opposed to this other person who just came out of nowhere and disrupted my peace and my sanity, you know. I was doing fine before this one came, right? But give her that sense of autonomy and control and leadership by giving her choice. And inshallah, she'll start to model the right behavior. I mean, that's just my tip, but any other parents, feel free to jump in if you have tried and tested uh, advice. Mashallah. You're welcome, Abdullah. Yeah. I'm sorry, just uh, briefly because I, I just remembered on the topic of sharing, um, one of the things I also did with my kids, and Alhamdulillah, we still do it now. There are certain things that I always did share with, have my kids share because it was Sunnah. So, for example, you know, we, we know that. It's sunnah to eat from one plate, right? It's sunnah to even drink from one cup. So those are things that I did start off early with my kids. And even now, we'll have one drink that we're all sharing. And I just yesterday, I said, do you guys remember why we, we, we did this? It's not that I can't go get more cups for everybody. But there's barakah when you're sharing from one vessel. And, um, you know, and, and the plates, um, I, said, I told them even last night, I said, we need to do the plates too. But the plates was just because we're, the table's kind of far spread out. So I said, maybe if we sit on the ground, we can do the plates. But it's good to get your children in the habit of, of eating from one plate. So then they, they won't get so territorial. I think it's part of the territorial behavior comes because we're separating everything, right? You have your cup, your juice box, mine. And then it's like, mine, mine. But if you're saying, no, we all share, which is the Sunnah model, then nobody feels threatened because everybody's hand is in this. You know what I mean? So try that with young children too. And inshallah. Yeah, like I always split everything. Their juice box, they would both share. And then I would say, if you finish the juice box, we can get another one. So you don't need to have two separate. You get it? It's, it's like a psychological trick. It's like, just drink from the same one. When it runs out, I'll open up another one. So you're still getting two juice boxes. But I'm not mentally separating them so that you have yours and he has his. And, and then they would always be respectful. And, and now, even to this day, if there's anything left over, alhamdulillah, it's from Allah, they'll split it naturally and give it to each other. They don't look at it like, oh, it's one last, it's for me. They look at it like, oh, it's one last, I have to split it. So it's just something that works if you do it that way, inshallah. Okay? Alhamdulillah. Thank you, everyone. Any